Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I'd like to thank Michael Starrett and Lee Mannix for organising this wonderful um, seminar or conference. Um, it's, it's badly needed, and, and I think it's great to be here. And also, I would like to acknowledge the huge help that the Heritage Council has been to, to Watford City in general and to the museums in particular over the last 20-something years, so I'd just like to publicly acknowledge that. Uh, uh, what we did in Watford, of course, fits very well into what we're talking about here today. Can you, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, between 1986 and 1992, and I think I see Sarah McCutcheon up there, upstairs, yes, I do. Um, uh, Sarah was one of the directors of, of this dig here in Watford with, with Morris Hurley and Orla Scully, and a, a fifth of the Viking city was archaeologically resolved to make way for a new development. It took six years to do the excavations and made way for a new shopping centre. And I suppose for the first time, the people of Watford were made aware of, particularly, I think, of their Viking heritage. The medieval heritage is very obvious in the city in terms of the number of the remains of, of monasteries, medieval monasteries, and, of course, there's six towers still standing on the walls and sections of town walls. So, but certainly the Viking history of the city, apart from scholars or people with an interest in history, um, the public wouldn't have been aware. But, of course, they found... Um, uh, 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 the remains of 72 Viking Age houses, which of course put the Vikings very much on, on the map. Uh, uh, consequent to that was, um, you can see there the remains of, of wattle houses and then of course semi-sunken houses, graves, um, uh, church, an early church, St Peter's Church, uh, uh, a ditch and a wall that was built in front of it, um, about, 11, about 1137, probably after MacMorris' uh, siege of the city that, in that year or before it maybe, uh, and um, one of the beautiful things that they found of course is this magnificent brooch. And then from the 13th century we got lots of dwelling houses. This may be, this may be a church belonging to the, to the, um, the Knights Templars or the Knights Hospitallers. Um, again this beautiful brooch from, the, from about 1210. And for the next few years after that, and Sarah will be well aware of this, we spent the next, until 1996 then, they spent the rest of the time uh, preparing a report on this, which was quite, at the time it was unique, that all of the, the results of, the, of a huge excavation, about a fifth of the historic city, um, was published by Watford Council. And also, um, working with the department and the Heritage Council, by the way, we got Heritage Council grants for both of these books, um, also when the Woodstown site was discovered, we managed in Waterford Council the, um, the the publication or the museum rather the publication of, of the Woodstown book also. And I, I think before I go on and say too much, I would like to, to highlight the fact that what we've done in Waterford wasn't wasn't kind of let's build a museum and open it up and all will be well. There has been 24 years of conservation and again a lot of money for that conservation came from the Heritage Council but like there was there is a 30-year conservation program of manuscripts, nearly to nearly 30 years. Um, sorry, there's 24 years. There was a 14-year conservation of medieval vestments. There was obviously the continuous, ongoing conservation of all the objects found and the, the, the objects that, that needed conservation found in, in, in the excavations. And we had a 12-year conservation program on paintings. Uh, historic paintings. So it, it, these things just don't happen overnight and we didn't rush into anything madly or, or blindly. Um, and there, there's a list of the publications that the, that the City Council has in one way or, or, or another um, uh, promoted and, and, and financed in one way or another and worked with, with scholars to produce over the last um, 15 years or so. Um, in, 19, in 1999 then, we, we, well obviously we started before that, um, we, we acquired this, this um, grain store on the Keys in Watford and we, we opened it up as a museum and that's where we, we, we displayed the treasures of Viking, medieval and, and modern Watford and that, that was successful to a point. We were getting about 30,000 visitors. It wasn't in the best location, mind you, style-wise the museum was very, very beautifully designed and great big atrium was created up through by removing sections of the of, of the floors and and just, uh, by, by the london-based architect peter Ahrens. um and so we were there for, we were there for seven years and then another big archaeological event happened in watford and we, we came to know about it and again i would like to praise the heritage council because i think it was the heritage council that ensured that the site would be preserved um uh, uh, and created into a national monument um, unfortunately, because of all sorts of financial restraints, the site was only partially excavated, but the, the motorway 
that the bypass motorway that connected Waterford to Dublin was moved, that the section that was going to connect Waterford to Cork that never happened because of the recession. But this, this site uh, at Woodstown, it was considered the first ever excavated, um, or partially excavated, um, Longford in Ireland. And of course, it dates back probably to as early as the 850s. And this was a hugely important discovery for us in Waterford because one of the problems with the earlier excavation, even though it wasn't, it was in what the area we call the Viking Triangle, the larger area that we call the Viking Triangle, the earliest uh, finds we got in that particular area dated only to dated back to around 1000. Um, but in this site, which of course didn't match um, with with the written evidence. Um, at this site, of course, goes back to, to, to about 850. And this site is one like the other sites in Europe, like Hedeby and Kaupang and places like that, that tend to die out um, at the beginning of the 10th century, sometime around 920. But the site is important. It produced a really important material for the amount of it that was excavated. Um, that's the site. It's five, about five kilometres upriver from Waterford. And you can see the, the marks there where the, the trial testing was done. Um, they discovered, of course, a warrior's grave, which we have now on display in Reginald's Tower, the, the grave goods from that, just the metal parts of it. Organic material didn't survive well here. Um, uh, there's the sword prior to and after conservation. And then, as a result of, of the discovery of this site, uh, I, I realised that in the building that I've just shown you earlier on there, the, the grain store, the granary building on the Keys, that that wasn't big enough to house what I expected to be a huge big amount of Viking material, which never realised because, of course, the site wasn't fully excavated. But I went to the city council and I asked them, um, could, we, could we redevelop the old part of the city, which has really gone very run down, and I'll show you that. And I came up with this plan. We had a very, a very um, easy to persuade city manager at the time, and he, he gave us the finance to come up with the plan, and we decided to develop the oldest part of the city um, that was that was with well there wasn't at the time but we now have archaeological evidence going back to 914. Um, uh, we decided to develop that as part of a, of a plan, a big development plan, and that's the area there that you're seeing on screen that we developed. Um, where you see the roadway, you can see the river shore binding it on on the north, and then on 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 the on the south, the south the southeast. You can see a road which was. Uh, up until about 1700, what was a river? It's now been moved. Uh, now been moved out. So it still has the streetscape is still Viking, the the and, and medieval and, and and the buildings there. A lot of them are on the footprint of earlier. For example, Christian. Obviously, when the Vikings became Christianized, they built churches and all the rest of it. So that's it. Very much takes the pattern from it, the Viking age. Um, so. We got permission to, to try and develop this area, which, as I said, was very run down. And I remember in 2007, I was saying to the council that I'd like to have this prepared, everything done by 2014. So we set ourselves a timescale of 2014, because in 2014, in 914, according to the Annals of Ireland, the Vikings returned to Ireland, and they, they then, it's only in, they come to Waterford, and then in, in 917, it's of course the, the Regnal, Son of Ivor um, attacks Dublin from a base in Waterford, and also um, Sarah. He also eventually becomes King of York. Now Sarah and I have had these discussions for a while, so it's all kosher, okay. But anyway, we did have all these developments done um, by by um, nine fourteen, sorry twenty fourteen, and those those horrible buildings you see on those grain stores are now all demolished, and we've signed an agreement now with some. Saudi Arabian investors to develop all this as a, as a new part of the city, which is looking very positive for Waterford. We put all this plan together in a, in a project called the Viking Triangle Project, and we launched in 2007, and we were very pleased with ourselves, and we were even being told that it was a very good plan, we'd probably receive government funding for it. And then in 2008, just as they were about to announce the government funding, the, the economy collapsed and the funding was deferred completely. But, and then in 2009, adding insult to injury, that, that Waterford Crystal Factory closed in 2009. So all our kind of, everything started to fall down around us quite literally. And, uh, and, and a building that we had bought to build a new civic offices in, um, uh, we bought it from the former electricity supply board uh, when they moved down to Cork. And um, we bought that building with the intention of knocking it. This was in 2007. Um, giving, giving the museum buildings that, that the council were using at the time 
and we, we bought this building and the idea was to knock it, put civic offices there, but foolishly or, or, or luckily fortuitously the council had offered me some buildings and I took possession of them and said well, it's too late now to change your mind so we have to develop them as museums as well planned and it did work out in the end, we, all, we worked it out. So before we could do anything of course we realised and, and, and I know we're talking about archaeology but tourism is very important and that's very important to Watford now and we, we had to redevelop that so this is the building redeveloped, that's it when, when, when uh, but when, when Watford Crystal closed, we decided to bring them into the city centre. And because and the reason they were brought into the city centre is because the Viking Triangle project was already, it, not, it hadn't started, but it was planned, and therefore we had the plan in the drawer, and this was going to become part of it. And there you can see this is what, how, what we developed it into. It's the same building, just recad and made it look a bit more presentable than it was earlier. But then we decided to develop when we're deciding to develop the museums, we wanted to develop them in buildings that associated, were associated with the history. So wh when you look at the, the, the museums in the Viking Triangle, and we hope to open two later on uh, in next year, sorry, in 2019, we decided Reginald's Tower, named after, it's, a, it's now a Norman Tower, an Anglo-Norman Tower, but we decided to put the, the Viking material in there because the tower is named after Reginald, one of the Viking leaders of the city, and possibly the first leader. And we decided to put the Viking material there, and then we decided to put the, the medieval material in, in a new building, a new purpose-built building, it's the only purpose-built medieval museum in the country, and we decided to put that in, in, in over a medieval um, chorister's hall that was underground at the time. So th that's where we decided to put that, and then all the material from 1700 upwards we decided to put into the Bishop's Palace, which was a former bishop's palace, but up until the time we got it in the museum, it was it was the engineering department of the council, which intended moving out into the into the building, um, which became the Water Crystal Building, and this is what Reginald's Tower looked like at the time, horrible 1960s building beside it, and this is this is this is what we did then. We bought the building beside it. We knocked it. We actually at the time we couldn't afford to buy it, so we did a deal with with the owner for a building that we already owned, an office block that we owned, and gave that to the builder instead, and then demolished the building. We then using a FOSS scheme and from, from timbers, Viking tim, Viking age timbers, the, uh, ships timbers that we found during an excavation. We we worked with the people in Oskilde in Denmark, and we built this ship and put it outside so as to be kind of bring basically the archaeology out onto the street for people. You can see the ship's timber in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the tower. We had to of course completely restore the tower and there you can see the restore tower inside. In the 1950s somebody had a very clever idea that the cement rendered the tower inside of it. So all that had to be taken off and we worked with the OPW on that and you can see the, the results of that. This is, where, this is the site where the, the medieval museum now is and if uh, we had to and the small buildings there with the blue doors and, and opes on them they're actually the back of a theater in the city hall which it's an 18th century theater in the city hall that backs onto this site it's, it's slightly convoluted even for water people to understand so we had to include the theater block as well as a museum in this space it's a fairly small space and um, at the time what happened was the theatre got a grant from the Arts Council to build a new theatre uh, dressing rooms and back of stage facilities and then a few months later we got the grant to, to build a museum from Fall to Ireland by the way I must give them huge credit for that and uh, so I had to go down to the city manager which I don't think he really liked but he agreed that I had a point that we have to stop the people in the theatre building their extension until we designed an extension that fitted the space because it was too important. It's, the space it was in was too important, being near the beautiful 18th century cathedral. And he agreed. I don't know if the people in the theatre think were a little discombobulated for a while, seeing that they had no windows in their building now. But anyway, um, we got over, we kissed and made up. And this this is the underground building that we excavated, the Choristers Hall. Inside that building, and I don't think I have a slide of it now, I forgot to put one in. Inside that building, the, the stonework, the decorative stonework, the, the, the window ops and the door um, mouldings and, and the, the edges of the pillars are done in Dundry stone. And instead of, uh, so what we did was, Dundry stone was imported to Ireland as ballast on ships into Waterford in the, in the 13th century. And as this was a medieval museum, we went back to the quarries in Dundry and got the same stone to put on the outside. 
fact that the project went two million over budget we won't mention. Um, that's the demolition of, this, of the material at the back of City Hall, you can see it there now. And then this is, you can see the little tower that was a folly built in the 19th century to allow the dean who lived in the building beside it access down to this little, uh, this little underground building. I don't know what exactly was up to down there, but I'm sure it's something to 50 shades of grey or something like that. But anyhow, <laughs> we won't go into the dealings of the dean. He actually, we found a letter recently, a gossipy letter from, from the period where, where it says that the dean had, um, was clearing out this building, this choristers hall, and this was in 1848, and he found, according to the newspaper, two, two coffins. Talk about eight, 19th century archaeology. He found two coffins with undecomposed monks in the two of them, and he charged everybody twopence to come and see it, and that's what he used to finance the clearing out of this. We wouldn't do anything like that nowadays. Um, anyway, this is then, we, we archaeologically resolved the site of the, of, of the museum. You can see it there, we were pointing the, the you can see the wall there, we were pointing the, the, the choristers hall, and you can see a building on top of it. That was 19th century. Look, we were able to take that down as well. But we, uh, or the Scully um, um, archaeologists resolved that. We took this fire escape away from the back of City Hall. It was a huge undertaking. And all of the material that we found in that, instead of dispersing into different parts of different museums, we kept them all in that space in the Choristers Hall. We designed the building to keep them in that space. Um, that's what it looks like on the outside. The glass... Um, the glass in front of the building, I don't know if you, how you get on this pointer, but you can see glass in the, in the pavement. You're looking at the actual the outside of the choristers hall when you're coming to the building you know, through, through that glass. Okay, so, um, and the little image on, on, on the end there, I'm going to be really licking out to all the women and tell you that that image, and this is true, we decided that women don't have a place in history, or at least they're not given enough places in history. So we decided, let's put a woman on the building. So we put this lovely piece, it's a belt mount, it's about two inches tall, it's a little bronze belt mount, and it would have been probably, the belt probably would have been given by a lady to a knight, and it's got this lovely image of a lady holding something or minding something, protecting something. We found that in the excavation, so we used this uh, as the image to go on the gable, it's about 18 foot long, and it's actually done like you do a medieval sculpture, it was done on a big table, mason's table, and then when the building was, when it's been put together, he actually finished it off on site. Up with scaffolding. Have I five? Okay, that's the building at night. Um, these are says, the Great Charter Road, which was financed, um, the conservation of which was financed by, by um, the Heritage Council, uh, and thanks for that. Um, and, and these wonderful vestments, people come from all over the world to see these vestments. By the way, there's archaeology throughout this exhibition as well. Uh, th these are wonderful. There was a 14-year programme of conservation, and I would like to thank the Irish Council publicly for sticking with us for 14 years and, and every year giving us money to do this. I think it's one of the great conservation uh, projects, objects in, in Ireland, and we're, we're, it, it's really wonderful. People still gasp when they come in and see this exhibition. Um, that's other, this is the deanery building. Now, this is afterwards, and you can see the state of the place. This is Cathedral Square, the main square of the city. This is what it looked like when we started the project. This is a laneway that, that was part of that. This is it now, Chairman's Arch, we developed as social housing. We put, in, we put in a chess set that people can play with. It's made of acrylic, it's based on the Lewis chess set. Here's the Bishop's Palace garden before, turned when the engineers had to turn it into a car park. And here it is, we restored the town wall, replanted the garden. Here's the inside of the palace, which used to be offices. And we then decided on a programme of museums without boundaries. We had Viking festivals. We have um, we, we put the roof back on Greyfriars Tower, we put the ship there, we showed you that, we put in these, I know some people think they're a bit crass, but actually every day you pass Reginald's Tower, you see somebody getting their photograph taken here, it's all about images and, and selfies nowadays and all that sort of carry on. And then in, in the ground we put the archaeology into the ground to show you where we found the objects and marked the town wall, and then we did these beautiful um, circular uh, bronze wayfinding signs. Mind you, the finance officer did ask me to live here a finger post when he saw the bill, but anyway. Um, these were done in France, and they're, they're, they're handy in the sense that you don't even have to be able to read in, in the English language or understand the English language. You can find your way around by just using them because they're, they're very they're three-dimensional, obviously. Um, that's making the, the chess pieces. This is a sword we put in last year, and these are glass signs. And then we, we have the festivals. This is a walking tour we do with stocks and other marriage of Strongbow and Aoife. These are enamel signs over buildings just to 
reflect the history of them. There's a wine vault there, an interactive sculpture here that people sit on. It's a great place for marriage photographs. And we, we've also done a lot of public works uh, out, in, out in the public arena, um, the signage. Uh, First World War obviously is covered with, with, with this piece. And um, this is one we put in last year. Then we're constantly doing it on John Hearn, who wrote our constitution and first Irish ambassador to America. Um, Christchurch Cathedral and the walking tours and then we're continuing to develop we did this exhibition two years ago in City Hall it lists all the mayors 700 and something of them mayors of Waterford and then there's this virtual reality um, which was a huge success uh, it's based on history of, of, of the city and again the Viking history of the city it's virtual reality it's number one in TripAdvisor for the last two years it's in the top one percent of visitor satisfaction on TripAdvisor for Ireland it's totally pays for itself, it, it attracts huge numbers of visitors and in all those museums we attract over 100,000 visitors a year and we recreated a Viking house exactly the specifications of one that Orn Scully excavated, okay? And we say it's a co-maker's house and then you go in and after 15 minutes discussion you, you um, put on this Oculus Rift and I would really urge anybody who's interested in virtual reality how it can change our understanding of archaeology and history and, and to go and see it. That's the Norwegian ambassador at the opening. And next year we're opening a Museum of Time and we're opening a Museum of Death, probably the year after, um, in, an, in the old Alms House in Cathedral Square. And, and, and in this building here, beside the Medieval Museum and the Cathedral, the old Deanery building, we're opening a Museum of, of Irish Silver um, next year also. And this was a, a Viking festival we had last year in conjunction with Sarah, wherever she is, uh, and the people in York and uh, we're, we're both part of a destination Vikings and a, an EU program called Follow the Vikings and here are Spanish Vikings believe it or not this is from a town in Cretoria in Spain that was invaded by the Vikings and we had a great fun there one weekend there last Easter okay and that's that's what I have to say before I'm told to stop talking <laughs>